Hello everyone, we can start now. Uh, welcome to the 24 hours of past, 20 years of past, past learnings and future visions. We're excited you could join us today for Srikar Shadari's session, Modernized Data Platform, a Detailed Case Study. This 24 hours of past consists of 24 consecutive live webinars delivered by expert speakers from the past community. The sessions will be recorded and posted online after the event. You will receive an email letting you know when these are available. If you require technical assistance, please type your request into the questions pane located on the right side of your screen and someone will assist you. This question pane is also where you may ask your questions throughout the presentation. Feel free to enter your questions at any time. And once we get to the Q&A portion of the session, I'll read your questions aloud to the speaker. You will be able to zoom in on the presentation content by using the zoom button located on the top of the presentation window. Please note that there will be a short evaluation at the end of the session, which will pop up after the webinar ends in your web browser. Your feedback is really important to us for future events, so please take a moment to complete this. This 24 hours of past session is presented by Shikars Adaris. Shikars Shiharsh has 15 plus years of experience helping customers setting up data platforms focused toward Microsoft BI. He has helped multiple global customers across different industries with enterprise data platforms and business intelligence stack. Over the past few years, he has helped customers migrate to on-premise data workloads onto cloud data platforms, Azure, Azure, a Amazon Web Services, AWS, and set up new data platforms on cloud. And without further ado, here is Sriharsh with Modernized Data Platform, a detailed case study. Thank you, um, Milen. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this session on Modern Data Platform, um, a detailed case study. Yeah, so this is today's agenda. First of all, we will look at uh, what a modern data platform is. Uh, why do we need one? Um, you know, what is wrong with the additional, existing enterprise data warehouses and why do we need to build a modern data warehouse? What are the key external factors which has influenced the uh, EDW and what are some internal factors which motivates customers to move to a modern data platform? Over the past few years, I've been working with few customers in this space, so wanted to share a detailed case study on it, um, rather than giving a more of a theoretical approach on the transformation from an existing on-premise EDW um, to an cloud-based uh, EDW or a modern data warehouse. I thought of, you know, it will be more pragmatic to share it via a case study. Then it will be followed by a demo. Uh, Microsoft offers few tools and technologies to migrate um, on databases on Azure. So I would, uh, you know, showcase one of the tools. Then we will look at some key considerations and best practices uh, as well, uh, which will be followed by some question and answers uh, you might have, right? So let's look at a traditional EDW. Um, if you are from an EDW background, um, now, you know, Traditionally, we had seen our EDWs wherein we have data coming in from your line of business applications, such as your SAPs or ERPs. They are converted into flat files. And on a daily load, they are loaded into an operational data store, right? And using that, we have this operational reporting or else you would load the data um, or call this operational data store either pre as a pre-staging or a staging layer as well, and then load the data into a data warehouse. And if you're maybe following an Inmon or a Kimball model, uh, distribute the data warehouse data into different data marts, right? Depending upon uh, the dimensional modeling which you're adopting. Then you have the OLAP layer, which would help you perform the historical analysis, right? So everything was well and good 
uh, then data volumes grew over a period of time so that's when you know your single multi-processing architecture single processing architecture such as oracle sql servers you know they could handle till certain extent but you wanted more compute power so that's when all this mpp based architecture such as your teradata of the world or microsoft pw or aps netaza greenplum all these have started right but with the downside they're a bit expensive as compared to an smp architecture now if I look from an um, analytics perspective or from an end user perspective, right? I get different en enterprise data sources. Like I get uh, data around, I mean, this is this scenario is more around a manufacturing data warehouse um, to take an example scenario. Maybe I'm getting data from my, my machine performance data. I'm getting the downtime data and some operator related data. From the external world, maybe I'm getting some supplier data, uh, right? So using this data, what I'm able to do as a KPI or a key performance indicator from a reporting standpoint is I'm able to monitor the past event, like how my machine has performed in the past last week or you know two weeks back, and what are my downtime diagnostics. That's more in reportive or you know descriptive analytics in nature, right? But all was well and good. Then we even had the self-service uh, era where users wanted more power in their um, hands, but over the past few years, there have been few factors which have been uh, influencing the EDW. From an external standpoint, we have seen the evolution of big data, wherein um, there's huge amounts of data which is being generated um, off late, be it from data from your telemetry devices, such as your sensors, uh, your cars are emitting data, your equipments, uh, your refrigerators, all are emitting um, data, your social networking feeds such as Twitter, Facebook, all of them are emitting data. And it has become very important for customers to maybe perform some churn analytics scenarios or predictive analytics scenarios to take advantage of the data, maybe capture all the data points or all the interactions which an organization is having with the customer. They want to basically capture all this data into a single repository. But traditional EDW isn't meant for handling that kind of a volume. So from a big data standpoint, you have data with different volumes, uh, different velocity. Uh, traditional EDW was more batch ETL in nature, but we have velocity wherein you get a sub-second, you want the data to be ingested into your EDW with a sub-second latency. Then even variety, right? Uh, traditionally, you had only structured data uh, in a CSV file format, but now you have data coming in terms of images, files, um, and uh, uh, semi-structured data such as your logs, etc. Right? Then uh, over the past few years, we have even seen uh, the rise of cloud technologies, where, which provides a great advantage and lowering the cost. Um, you don't have to wait for weeks and months to get your infrastructure or hardware. Right? You can. Um, you, you you can maybe you know you want to spin up in um, a cluster or a server on the fly and you can focus more on your application needs rather than you know uh, maintaining or you know procuring those uh, uh, those uh, uh, servers uh, this only not only you know lowers your cost but also your faster time to market it definitely provides a scalability and agility like if you take a scenario a retail scenario right at thanksgiving they have huge sales so um, um you know their servers are uh, loaded so in peak time maybe you want to scale up your hardware and you you want to um, you know uh, downsize when it when it is not a peak time so cloud provides you with all that uh, elasticity uh, same uh, thing one other key point is innovation right off late new technologies are emerging uh, every now and then um, and customers want to maybe just try try out certain um, you know a feature within a uh, cloud-based technology so they can just do it or experiment with it maybe uh, look at it either fail fast or adopt it if it is uh, looking good so that's another advantage of uh, of uh, you know uh, using the cloud-based technologies um, cost is definitely a key factor with cloud with uh, with cloud but again uh, it is uh, i mean it should be used in a right way to take uh, you know to um, to you know to get the most benefit with respect to cost uh, from cloud third one is ai and ml we had seen a good you know there have been a um, lot of disrupting companies like you uber uh, we have seen netflix you know they have been small startups but because of the ai and ml capabilities right um, uh, they have been uh, you know um, they are market leaders today right similarly now it's the uh, era of b2b uh, businesses adopting uh, you know ai and ml uh, maybe the previous scenario which i was showing uh, customers instead of looking at the descriptor or a reactive analytics they want to look at some predictive analytics scenario um, right previously it was a nice to have feature 
but now it has become very very extremely crucial and mandatory for every customer to you know adopt these uh, um, you know ai and ml as part of the data strategy in order to be uh, competitive um, right so that that was more from an external standpoint now if you look at some internal factors or enterprise factors you know uh, which help or you know which motivate a customer to migrate onto uh, cloud based technology one is cost savings and avoidance we touched upon that uh, when we touched upon the cloud um, aspect of uh, the edw second is end of life uh, or a roadmap like some products like netaza is a classic example it was an mpp based architecture which does not have a roadmap now so customers who were on um, netaza based architecture they want to maybe move on to uh, a cloud based uh, um, solution then uh, these days we see a lot of uh, um, you know acquisitions and mergers happening so customers want to maybe merge their existing uh, um, um, you know uh, data platforms into one single uh, data lake and go about it so on and so forth so these are a few factors which has been into in um, you know influencing edw and uh, and definitely you know all data all organizations want to be data driven these days um, because of this um, because of these factors so <clears throat> so this is the modern edw i would say so there is this new data thinking uh, that is even called as data hoarding wherein all the data which an organization has access to or an enterprise has access to, access to has potential value right traditionally if you look at an uh, at, at an edw you would extract the data you would perform multiple trans transformations multiple complex transform transformations i would say and then then load the data into the warehouse but now uh, with the huge amounts of data you wouldn't have that much of a capability or the need um, uh, to actually process the data so um, there is this new data, data thinking around data hoarding wherein all data has potential value load it in its native format basically take an um, um, you know uh, look at the data as an extract load transform as an elt rather than an as an etl so that's where the concept of data lakes has emerged wherein you have data coming in from your social media feeds your iot devices your web devices um, and then you know your enterprise data as well right so load everything into and data lake and then uh, build up your um, uh, your operational data store or a data warehouse um, so on and so forth and then have your data much and also in order to cater to your big data you have uh, hadoop based technologies which you can uh, use and then you even have uh, machine learning wherein you can take uh, all the data which are maybe look at an, a scenario right uh, where a customer has launched a new product and he wants to understand from the sentiment analysis an analysis how he is doing with respect to you know that particular product in the market so uh, he can basically get the data into data lake and do some machine learning algorithms on top of it right um, so if i look if um, the similar scenario which i was showing on the manufacturing warehouse in the traditional edw i have the same sources apart from that uh, as an example maybe i'm getting machine telemetry data Initially, using traditional EDW, I was able to know how my machine has performed last week. That was more reactive in nature, right? But now, using this advanced modern data warehouse, what I could do is I could predict what would my be my machine state in six months down the line. When what do I mean? When do I need to maintain it? Um, right? When will it fail? You know, those are those intelligent um, you know decisions which I can make so that I can plan for the maintenance so that there is no machine downtime and my um, you know business is doing great. This was just an example scenario, but you know it's the same thing applies to your churn and beat your churn analytics um, or. Um, or predictive analytics or sales forecasting or supply chain forecasting or your inventory management uh, forecasting um, so you can you know ex expand this uh, um, um, around predictive analytics right using modern data um, edw so essentially key points cost savings um, you know predictive analytics um, and then um, ability to process all kinds of data so traditionally this modern edw follows something called as a lambda architecture wherein uh, you have a batch etl as well as a streaming data so you are taking care of both of them and then you have the serving layer which um, you know which is this particular layer over here now let's step back a bit and look at uh, what azure um, has to offer um, in this uh, um, data landscape right if you ask me three years uh, uh, back or you know a couple of years back we just had azure sql database um, um, right as an option um, in Azure, but now look at it, right? I mean, the ecosystem uh, has emerged. 
um, tremendously like I mean only with respect to SQL server I have almost around five options all right let's just uh, just a side note uh, there are uh, attendees complaining that they could not see the slides could you please recheck if you are displaying the slides have you continued displaying them we see the modernized data platform title slide oh is it yes okay let me reshare those um, slides once again please uh, are you able to see now i'm showing the um, agenda slide and then i'm showing the traditional edw slide no, no, we only see the agenda. I think you might have paused your sc screen sharing. Just uh, hit. No one. Okay, let me. Uh, so is, is it? We're good now. Yes. Okay, you're, you're able to see now, right? I mean, I'm at the agenda. Um, so uh, sorry if you had missed the uh, earlier slides, but this was the agenda which I was showing. And then we had this traditional EDW um, architecture, uh, which showed the ETL. Um, and then uh, this was the scenario which I was talking about, wherein you know, you you could uh, view the, um, the past uh, uh, information. And then um, you had this about factors influencing the EDW around the different external factors around big data rise of cloud ai and ml and then all the internal factors right and this was the modern data warehouse architecture and i'm right now at the azure data landscape um milan uh, hope you're able yes. to see my screen now right yes yes everything is fine great. now great great uh, okay. i apologize great. also i apologize as well for not being I sure. No. Tell you we were we were listening to you and waiting for the slides to. Oh, is it okay? I was like, yeah, sure, not a problem. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I was here at the Azure Data Landscape. So, only with respect to SQL Azure, now you have almost five options. I will touch upon some key components, not all of them. So, Azure SQL Database, it's nothing but uh, your traditional um, um, SQL Server. But uh, you know, um, there are some features which are not supported, but it's an platform as a service offering um, it's not hosted on vm um, wherein you can just focus on the application and you know um, you can um, access that uh, uh, i mean basically azure meet as a sql server not hosted on v uh, on a vm and you, you can use sql server management studio to access your uh, sql server you know imagine it that way underlying infrastructure everything is taken care of by microsoft our latest in the entries is your SQL Server managed instance. So this is pretty much has a very good feature parity with respect to uh, on-premise SQL Server. Maybe some customers who wants, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, a, a good feature parity with their on-premise SQL servers, they can go with this option. Few, very few features like SQL Server agent job that's not supported. And a good thing about this is it supports up to eight terabytes of data. And your Azure SQL DB it supports now up to four terabytes of data. Right. Second thing is Elastic Pool. So these are uh, something, you know, the use cases which would bear and you would use in SQL Server with ADTU or, um, you know, uh, Elastic Pool is when you have a SaaS based application, right? A retail scenario again, um, in case you have a customer uh, who wants to scale up or scale down. So, you know, they can spin up and SQL database uh, as and when they are spinning up and um, an instance of their web application, right? So that, that's when you would go with an Elastic Pool. Uh, fourth one is Azure SQL Data Warehouse. Um, again, this is uh, exact replica of your MPP-based architectures. It, it's basically, think of it as a Microsoft APS or a PDW on-premise or your Teradata or Green Plums, you know, this could replace that. Snowflake is another, uh, it's not a Microsoft product, but it's a third-party product, but it's gaining a lot of traction off late uh, for, in a data warehouse space. Fourth option or the fifth option is the Azure SQL Server on VM. There, there are still use cases when you would go with Azure SQL Server um, hosted on an, on an Azure VM. 
couple of scenarios which I can think of as or think of it maybe you're working for an enterprise that enterprise security team it goes under a lot of cyber scrutiny and cyber security um, you know each com enterprise does it uh, after Microsoft provides that service right in case they are not they, your internal security team hasn't approved SQL uh, pass services that's when you would and but still you want to take advantage of cloud that's when in a quick lift and shift scenario you would go with an Azure SQL server on an virtual machine a second scenario which I can think of is maybe you have your uh, EDW pretty much customized, uh, right? So even in those scenarios, you would, uh, you know, go with an Azure SQL Server on an VM. Couple of other options um, which you have are um, Azure Analysis Services. Again, this is uh, very much like your SQL Server uh, Analysis Services on-prem, but that was a multi-dimensional model. Right now, as of today, uh, we have Azure Analysis Services supported with a tabular model. Right. Then Power BI, again, it's um, uh, the number one tool as per Gartner with respect to business intelligence. Um, couple of other products which I would touch on is Azure Data Factory. This is basically an orchestration tool. Interesting thing is when it launched a couple of years back, uh, customers have were a little bit skeptical about adopting it. Reason being, um, a lot of people, they were considering this as a competitor to SSIS or an, you know, but actually with version two, um, you know, um, it's it actually complements your SSIS SQL or integration services, wherein your existing SSIS packages, you can call using Azure Data Factory. And it's basically an ELTL tool, uh, right? I will show, talk more about it when I talk in the case study. Another key component is your Azure Data Lake Store. So this is essentially meant for, uh, as, think of it as an HDFS on the cloud, uh, right? Um, which has good Active Directory integration. And then, um, you know, it is, this is also in generation two. Uh, actually in generation two, the blob storage and Data Lake Store, uh, you know, they are merged into one single uh, um, service, uh, right? So these are some few components then you, for IoT analytics, you can use these components and for machine learning, you can use uh, uh, these components. So uh, right now, uh, from an, um, if you're looking or if you're already and um, are working for a customer or you know in your existing enterprise, you are using Microsoft uh, BI stack. Um, there's a good feature, um, you know, parity with respect to your Azure, right? If you are using SSRS, uh, you can basically host your you know SSRS paginated reports either in Power BI or you can you know deploy them in your Power BI report server. You know, you can take a migration path to uh, do that. Or if you are having a semantic model um, like SSAs, you could, uh, you know, take care of uh, or use Azure Analysis Services or Power BI, either one of these two options. Power BI, if, you know, your uh, size of the semantic model is not very high, you could go with Power BI. Similarly, you know, uh, there are uh, um, other uh, fact um, options available for SSIS, either use Data Factory V2 version 2 or use Databricks or Power BI Dataflow, which is new in the... Um, this is more of a business BI, um, uh, business ETL tool, think of it that way, right? Similarly, there are other options around advanced analytics, um, MDM and, and big data um, as well. Now let's look at uh, a case study scenario. Uh, what we'll do is we'll look at an, uh, um, an enterprise. So there is this small to medium um, organization. Uh, essentially, their end goal is to become a uh, data-driven organization, uh, right? When I say data-driven, they want to take all their decisions based upon uh, the, K the KPIs which they generate out of the EDW, right? Right now, they have an EDW which is hosted on Oracle 11G instance on-premise. Uh, again, they have uh, all the pre-staging, staging, and you know the typical architecture which I had shown. Um, and then they want to enhance their business KPIs basically now they have a new CEO and he wants to basically you know completely transform the existing um, EDW and also they want to implement a data lake reason being uh, they're expecting to integrate operational data um, in future so that's another reason why they would uh, you know want to you know uh, completely revamp their existing on-premise EDW and looking for a cloud-based technology um, reason uh, one of the key reason is they're having some challenges with respect to their infrastructure also and uh, very uh, huge performance issues uh, with tableau on premise um, and then you know it's very it's becoming very difficult and you know time consuming to procure new hardware uh, on premise one other key aspect also is uh, they want to have a sandbox environment for, for, for performing some machine learning use cases um, and then one key pain point is the business bi team is not very happy with uh, uh, with the way you know um, 
um, uh, the reports are being delivered. You know, it's it's being very time consuming, and they wanted more freedom to access different uh, um, the overall EDW ecosystem, be it your source systems or your data warehouses. They wanted uh, a better process, also, right, uh, and governance around it. So pretty much this is the architecture. Um, so they have different source systems, be it from your ERP and CRM, as you see a typical EDW. Uh, this is catering data from three different regions, um, APAC, um, your um, Asia Pacific zone, North America zone, and EMEA, Europe zone. And there are three batch um, loads coming in as in CSV file. Uh, they are landed on an Unix uh, server and using a, a daily load of cron jobs, they are loaded into an, Oracle 11G um, instance, which has different schemas for your pre-staging, staging, and then they have the facts and dimensions created um, in the data warehouse, um, right? Um, and then this, uh, these are being extracted using Tableau extracts, and then uh, KPIs are being created over here in the dashboard. Altrix is another uh, third-party product, which Business BI team is doing um, a Business BI ETL. So Altrix is basically, think of it as an ETL tool, but more of an, uh, you know, um, GUI um, based ETL tool where business users can actually you know transform or you know if they want to create some quick reports they're they're, they're actually using this already so that's the um, current scenario they and one other key point the current ETL they're not using any informatic or SSIs or any of that tool they're essentially doing it using stored procedures right PLS equal code so that's what they're using right now right so how do I go about uh, um, this, right? What are the initial steps which I would say when I have in a scenario like this, right? One is first thing we need to think about is the business priority. You know, how uh, aggressive is the business or the leadership team of an organization to set up a new EDW? So the reason why it is important is because that's where the funding comes from. That's where you can take key decisions as to should I completely migrate my EDW or take a step-by-step -step hybrid approach, right? Um, you know, that is uh, very key considerations. Uh, I mean, uh, this um, uh, to to for your architecture as well. Apart from that, there are some key factors. Of late, we see a lot of regulations and compliance around GDPR um, and other regulations such as, you know, PCI DSS or um, SOC 1, SOC 2. How do I adhere? Now that uh, you know, data is a core, uh, very sensitive part. So, and that too, you're putting it on a cloud, right? So, you should be extremely sure how do I secure that, uh, right? And address those concerns early on. Apart from that, what are my performance requirements? Uh, what are my latency requirements? As in, uh, what are my refresh rates, right? Uh, is it sub-second latency which I'm expecting? Are are business users expecting the reports uh, every five minutes or you know once a day or how is it? And then integration with on-premise, right? Uh, so uh, this is another key point to think of very very early on reason being how do I connect to the cloud? Uh, right? Well, what are my options available? So these are few things which you need to think about early on and plan for uh, that So and another point which I would like to touch upon is the BI maturity How is my current BI and what is the co corporate culture or the governance right now? Um, uh, will they be ready for a big change or I should approach it more strategically, right? So we're keeping that in mind. This is a structured transformation approach. Uh, this is a four-step approach, which I'm showing here. Um, some take a two-step approach. They would maybe merge the discover, prepare into one, migrate um, and stabilize into one stage. Or they have three stages, discover, prepare, and then migrate and optimize or, or stabilize are in one, one um, bucket. So in the discovery phase, essentially, it is nothing but an uh, doing and conducting a feasibility study or a requirement gathering. Um, um, and then uh, the next step is the prepare phase wherein you will execute multiple shorter POCs and choose one of these, uh, you know, migration options. Uh, um, and you basically narrow down on one of these migration options. Now coming to migrate, these are the five, um, actually uh, five hours, which um, these are four over here. Intentionally, I did not put a replace because replace is nothing but using an SaaS based applications, right? Completely eradicate your existing solution and replace with a software as a service based application. But right now for uh, we are just considering the four uh, options over here. These are proposed by Gartner uh, industry wide. These are what which is used for migrating any on premise irrespective of EDW, any on premise application onto cloud, right? 
So here, uh, refactor rehost is nothing but typical lift and shift of your application. Refactor is making some small changes. Um, maybe you know I would uh, replace SSIS with, uh, um, um, or maybe you know change my PLCL um, PLC equal code and you know uh, use a uh, um, an SQL SQL Server SQL code, right? Maybe small changes I would do. Rearchitect is maybe I would. Uh, completely get rid of my existing uh, uh, ETL routines, or maybe SSIS or ETL, and maybe build Azure Data Factory pipelines, right? And rebuild is completely uh, replacing your ETL layer, your EDW layer, and the reporting layer. So these are the five um, you know, options. Next one would be in stabilize or optimize. Once you're done with migration, you would stabilize your um, modern data warehouse, or you would even optimize to, inc to include uh, data engineering and advanced analytics capabilities. So this is um, the key, um, uh, you know, detailed steps with respect to each one of the phases. Uh, so in our case, what we would do is we would, uh, you know, since uh, I've shown the case study, we would understand what are my data latency requirement, right? In our case, it's uh, the data um, volume is not very high. It's just an um, uh, one terabyte database at this point, uh, and volumetric go growth is around uh, um, 100 GB every quarter, uh, right? So it's not very high. At this point, I'm not expecting huge real time or in telemetry data. Um, so that's what I understood from my discovery phase. Now coming on to the prepare phase, he, this is where you know I would do my uh, network uh, setup. So that there are essentially three options with respect to how I can establish my network connectivity from on-premise to Azure. One is either I would go with an point to site. That is nothing but I have my laptop and I'm connecting to uh, Azure. I would just uh, install a VPN gateway on my laptop and I would connect, right? But for typical enterprise uh, workloads, uh, point to site, and there is a second option, site to site, they are not very well recommended because if you want a good latency, uh, what you would have to do is you would have to ex uh, essentially have a private tunnel from your enterprise data center to uh, your Azure data center. So that's where express routes come in. That is not, um, um, to keep it very simple, it's a dedicated tunnel which does not work on your internet. It comes with different bandwidths, 10 Gbps and you know so on and so forth, depending upon the uh, your performance requirements which you want to achieve. And you will have to work with third-party vendors such as AT&T or Verizon to actually set up a dedicated tunnel. Sometimes it takes up to three to six months to set up that express route. So that's the reason it's very, uh, it's good to plan very early on when you're very serious about you know having uh, or adopting cloud. Another option is, you know, other um, things is you should execute multiple small POCs. In our case, we would execute a POC to ch check, you know, if ADF is a good option from an ELT standpoint, or uh, you know, I would do multiple POCs before actually uh, coming up with a detailed architecture uh, based upon some theoretical assumptions, right? So that is very important to do in the prepare phase. One other option to one other thing to do in the prepare phase is to finalize on the migration strategy should i would do i want to do a rebuild do i want to do a refactor in our case we are going to do with rebuild because they want to completely get rid of the on premise uh, workload and you know they want to just have the source systems on premise and then you know move everything onto onto um, cloud uh, onto cloud so that's what i would uh, you know do last phase is nothing but your hadr and devops so that's what will happen in the optimized phase right so this is the high level architecture after executing few POCs and stuff. I would come up with an, um, yeah, you know, architecture uh, like this. So what I would do is uh, in this scenario, I would approach it more in a strategic way. So here, surprisingly, see, I'm using SQL Server database as my warehouse. So you should never go by the name and, you know, take C adopt Azure SQL data warehouse. It's because it's extremely expensive and you need it only when, um, you know, you have um, data warehouse uh, sizes which are more than eight terabytes um, in size, right? Otherwise, you can very well uh, use Azure SQL database for doing your, you know, um, replacing your existing Oracle 11 G instance. Um, I would use uh, Azure Data Factory for doing my ETL. So what I would do is I would convert my current PL SQL code and I would, there's something called a stored procedure activity within Azure Data Factory. So I would call that and I would store the files initially in the Azure Data Lake store in their native format. And then using the stored procedure activity, I would load the data into SQL database, right? And then I would use SQL Server Analysis Services as my semantic layer. And then I have all the uh, Tableau. So they have this. They had this issue with Tableau on-premise. So for that, what I would do is, um, um, I would set up in a three-node Tableau. Uh, Tableau is available as Azure Marketplace product, right? So I would 
basically procure a tableau server um, on the cloud itself so one thing to keep in mind over here right um, it's better to have tableau on the cloud rather than having tableau server uh, hosted on premise and business users sitting azure reason being when data comes into azure there's no charge but if there is an egress they call ingress when you're importing data and they call egress when you're ex exporting the data so whenever you're getting data out of azure there's a charge involved so it's better you have your data um, you know or your tableau server set up on premise for better performance and lower cost so you know that's what i would do to resolve the tableau performance problem so now what i'll do is and then again uh, these are a few issues they had custom data quality jobs so there is no pass uh, or a platform as a service uh, um, product for data quality in azure so i would go with a sql server or mds dqs hosted on vm i would use azure devops to solve the governance problem which we had so this would help uh, me set up uh, ci cd based automated builds um, um, right and then i would use azure active directory um, I would create Azure Active Directory groups on premise. So this is a very interesting uh, area, right? So Azure Active Directory, you can create all your groups on premise and you can basically sync all your groups and users with uh, your uh, with your cloud based Azure Active Directory. Azure Data Catalog, again, this is a new product uh, launched. So this is basically for a data discovery, right? So business users, so they want if they want to, um, you know, um, know if if they want to create a certain report traditionally what used to happen is they would maybe look at their edw or they don't know whom to contact but azure data catalog is an excellent tool wherein whatever data sources which you are you consuming in your edw uh, or whatever data source or data you are having in your edw you can basically register in azure data catalog so you and it even maintains who is the owner of that day, particular data source or whom they should contact so it's basically a data registry or a or a data discovery tool it even has some sample records so users can come in they can see okay uh, okay i have the account table or account receivable data i have it over here so they can basically you know contact that particular person that um, hey i need uh, access to this particular because i need to recreate a custom self service report altrix we will still re retain in the ecosystem so now what I will do is I will not touch upon the other areas, but I would show a demo on how you can use SQL Server um, Management Assistant uh, to migrate um, Oracle 11G instance onto SQL Server. So essentially what we are doing over here is uh, uh, we would uh, basically use SQL Server Management Assistant to migrate your Oracle 11G instance onto, onto your SQL um, Azure. Um, this completely help um, this SSMA tool. It helps in all the three areas. One is schema conversion from Oracle to SQL. Um, then uh, even migrating the data. And if there is any issue with the schema, you can actually write a custom script to scrub that particular data, um, and then you know take the necessary action. So let's go ahead and look at the demo now. So Eric, are you able to see the screen? Uh, the demo environment. Uh, yes, Shikharsh, Me, Milan here, we always see is the presentation slide. So maybe you should switch to another screen. Oh, okay. Feel the same. No. Webcam. Okay. This is that. This is okay. fine. Okay. Great. Thank you. So here, what I'm doing is I have SQL Server Management Instance um, already installed. Uh, on my on my laptop over here and also i have oracle instance over installed so what i would do is i would i would connect to my oracle instance so here i would select the famous hr database hr schema in oracle language so it, this will load me the oracle schema over here right so essentially the way it works uh, in the background is it takes the oracle grammar um, and it converts that particular grammar into you know uh, a sql syntax uh, right and then you can basically create all the tables and stored procedures which you have in oracle in in your uh, you know azure sql data warehouse so here essentially if you look at it i have my hr database if i select it shows me that oracle in in oracle i have uh, two procedures i have seven tables and i have three sequences which i have been created uh, right so this is uh, what i have over here 
some housekeeping tasks uh, let us go to the default project settings so this tool i can use it to migrate from any one of uh, to any one of the target right uh, so this ssma is essentially targeted towards migrating uh, competitive databases such as oracle db2 plsql onto you know any one of the sql versions um, right. There are other tools which are need, which are basically more from migrating from SQL 2012 to 2014. I'll cover that later. But this is basically from an competitive database to an Azure SQL. In our case, let's select Azure SQL Data Warehouse, uh, right? Um, and then um, GUI, I selected uh, uh, yes, wherein it shows me the report conversion. So essentially, now um, uh, what I would do is I would uh, connect even to my um i already in the interest of time i already created uh, an azure sql data warehouse before the demo yeah so here it connect um, i'm connecting to the azure sql data warehouse so first step what i would do is i would go to this hr database and i would click uh, right click and i would click on convert schema so essentially what this would do is this would come uh, give me an a, entire report um, as in you know uh, what all uh, um, uh, you know uh, what all things it has converted so essentially it will show me here uh, that it has already done 74.5 percent of conversion there are some things which are not converted because data types within oracle and uh, and the sql server there could be different for example let me show you uh, uh, one of the example if i look at this particular uh, add job procedure over here it shows me uh, right you know the number precision uh, conversion for number data type can cause data loss so it's up to me either i can take this particular uh, schema i can uh, offline i can migrate it or you know i could uh, um, essentially tweak that particular schema um, uh, which can uh, align it to that particular you know for example here it shows me the sql so this is the pls oracle code over here and this is the sql server code uh, over here right so here essentially what you could do is uh, you could uh, you could um, um, you know convert it offline and then migrate the data right so now um, i even have a sql server management assistant over here now i what i would do is i could synchronize this with the database so here i'll um, in the azure instance i would go ahead and i would select azure sql data warehouse i would go to the query editor and here i would log on to this instance yeah so here i do not have any tables created um, at this point so what i would do is i would come to my um my instance over here and i would um, synchronize with database so essentially what i am doing over here is um, i would uh, uh, i am i am essentially converting or you know or synchronizing these objects over here whatever i have over here in the um in the ssma i am basically syncing up with my uh, with my azure so what essentially it would do is it would create those particular tables um, um in my uh, uh, in my azure instance as well right let's reconnect So see, it created all those tables over here um, for us, right? Similarly, uh, what you could do is um, you can even, uh, you know, select, uh, um, uh, you know, you can even migrate the data. You can right click and you can, you know, uh, uh, you know, migrate the data once you're done with, uh, uh, once you're done with uh, uh, your schema conversion, right? Once your schema is done, the next uh, first step, what you have done is you're basically um, looked at the syntax if they're aligning to your target data source. And then you would tweak them uh, if they are not. And the second step would be to synchronize or create these objects in Azure. And then the fourth step would be to migrate the data. 
one other thing which I wanted to show over here is uh, uh, since it's an um, Azure SQL uh, data warehouse, right? So the way um, uh, tables are organized in SQL Server uh, data warehouses, you can either have a round robin or a, or a hash distribution. Those are nothing but say, uh, you know, uh, if you have a where clause or something, then you would use hash, a hash distribution to distribute your data, right? So you can basically select the kind of distribution. So um, uh, which you want to align in your target so you can select even those options over here so once you're done with it the last step would be to migrate the data uh, right so uh, then you will again enter your sql and i'm logging on to my oracle instance and sql instance and then essentially what it will do is it will um, create my um, um, It'll uh, it'll create or migrate the data uh, over here, right? Excellent, Shikharsh. May I take a chance just to uh, encourage the attendees to uh, pose any questions sure. that we may ask them? We are nearing the end of this presentation. Sure. Ten more Perfect. minutes, maybe. Okay. Sure. Thanks. Yeah. So yeah. So that's about the migration part of it. So SSMA is a tool that is basically uh, targeted towards an Oracle uh, conversion onto um, either SQL Server or a, a SQL Server database on Azure or um, SQL Server managed instance or SQL Server data warehouse. There are other tools. So in phase one, we essentially created this architecture, right, where I am using SQL Server database. Uh, now let's go to phase two to address other. Before move going there, I would like to show some key considerations around it. So with respect to my Azure subscription, the way I would begin is I would take an Azure subscription um, and I would take that subscription and create uh, one VNet and create two subnets and use one subnet for a dev. I would, I would procure all my dev uh, components like you know Azure Data Factory and all your uh, databases so for uh, for one for the development. And in one in another subnet, I would procure all my test. Uh, components um, right second subscription is your sub subscription I would use it for the production um, instance right from an ingestion standpoint instead of using the standard CSV which we had seen in the traditional uh, um, uh, on-premise architecture I would use a parquet format reason for that is for better speed and compression right it will it will also help in my ETL uh, performance and also it will reduce my storage costs one-time migration we already looked at SSM and how it works and from a uh, landing zone and data lake standpoint I would you know uh, go with uh, you know uh, Azure SQL uh, Azure data lake gen 2 uh, for for storing my uh, uh, you know uh, for storing my parquet files uh, in the end uh, one other thing I would do is I would introduce power bi apart from tableau tableau I would use it for can reports and power bi for a self-service uh, uh, perspective right uh, one other uh, um, uh, some other key considerations with respect to the overall setup is uh, express route which we already covered um, uh, second thing is uh, uh, you know the environment provisioning again uh, we would use one vnet and the two subnets for the production and the dev i would also use azure devops services to uh, to for my build process so customer had that issue around builds right um, so i would use a ci cd pipeline uh, using azure devops and also i would use uh, azure arm templates extensively so you don't have to have your test and prod environments spun up every now and then right you 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 basically can there's new new thing called infrastructure as a code wherein you don't have to have your test uh, server like on premise uh, spun uh, spun up all the time you can basically dismantle all the environment and only uh, spun up or create uh, those environment only when you want to load the data and stuff like that with respect to resource group this is the naming convention i would follow uh, i would use uh, extensively the azure active directory architecture um, and then mds dqs uh, i would use as an component um, for data quality right with respect to phase two, if you looked at it, only one change I'm making over here, instead of using, a, if the data load increases maybe in six months or one year to eight terabytes, I would replace SQL Server data warehouse with managed instance. That would the next step I would do. And in the phase three, what I would do is since they wanted a sandbox environment with uh, machine learning, 
so i would use that a phase three so again i've sh 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 shown this more in a tactical or a strategic way if you want you can um, have azure databricks and azure ml in phase one as well but there should be a learning curve for the business users as well right so that's why i put over here in phase three and this is this is where you know i would use azure sql data warehouse if my data volumes are are increasing and i would use polybase to load the data into the data um, uh, warehouse and then here i have uh, web services consuming this data Final suggestions, again, uh, choose your SQL Server data warehouse uh, uh, strategically, don't go by the name, and then always perform a POC and you know give um, weightage to using a platform as a service component on cloud rather than uh, using an IS component, uh, right? And also uh, keep learning cur curve of the existing staff on mind, retrain them. Um, the BI is not about the technology, but also the domain part of it. So you know keep that in mind. And one other key point, Cloud is ever evolving, right? So keep your product roadmap in mind, uh, right? Uh, rather than making a big commitment, keep that also in mind. Um, so the case study which we have seen right now that was more complete, wherein you completely rebuilt or revamped the existing um, ETW, right? You build a fresh, you replace your ETL layer, reporting layer, database layer. There for some for this would suit for a lot of customers but for some customers who already have a matured organization or a modern data warehouse already set up they have they are doing great things on premise already they already have big data set up they have uh, advanced analytics set up but still they want to move to cloud uh, right because of the cost and the experimentation or innovation which they want to do um, right in those cases we would approach it in a hybrid way wherein first you would replace the reporting layer then maybe you would replace your edw layer then you would replace the semantic layer and then you would do the ELT layer, right? I mean, this is um, one example which I'm showing you, um, right? We say first you would, you can either do it reporting layer anytime, um, right? Uh, with respect to migration, then you would do the, uh, first you would do the database, then you would do the semantic layer, and the last it will be the integration services. So this is the, you know, strategic approach which you can follow uh, if you want to do a hybrid migration. And this is something which would take over a few years versus months. Uh, you know, that is one thing which we need to um, keep in mind. One other thing with from a tools perspective, SSMA, we have already looked at it. There are some other tools provided by Microsoft. One is data management, uh, Azure data Ma migration service. Uh, this is a latest offering. This is an Azure based migration service. Then there is something called as Azure Data Management Assistant. This is also a free tool. These all these are free. Um, the DMA and SSMA. These are standalone installable. As a DMA is more suited if you want to do a version upgrade within Microsoft Stack. Maybe you want to migrate from 20, 2005 to 2017. You would use that. There are some resources which I'm giving you over here um, as an next steps which you if you want to look at it. Um, so this is a very good uh, tool which Microsoft provides you, right? Wherein, um, wherein you can generate a playbook, right? So if I want to migrate from Oracle to um, to any to maybe you know SQL Server, so I can select this option. Then it it will actually generate a playbook for you. What are the detailed steps which you need to do from a pre-migration, migration, and post-migration? So this is an excellent tool which you can use, um, uh, you know, for if you're looking for uh, migration. Apart from that, there are other tools such as your Map Toolkit. So essentially, this is not related to database, but if you want to do any inventory of your existing, uh, um, you know, if you're doing huge migrations, that's when you would use um, uh, from a discovery standpoint. Then Azure Data Migration Services, use it when you're doing, uh, you know, uh, migrating a lot of databases at scale. It's an Azure-based service. It uses Azure DMA internally. Then there is something called as Azure um, um, data migration experiment assistant so this is again you want to migrate to a target database but you want to basically experiment how it will uh, perform over there so that's where you would download and use this tool so these are some options with respect to that um, any questions i can take up uh, uh, now um uh, milan let's give them yes let's give them a minute or two minute or two to think sure. of any questions yeah. Yeah. definitely so apart from that, uh, you know, uh, while we are waiting on the question, so um, there are a few aspects around um, SSRS to Power BI uh, report server uh, and some tools and tips which you can follow to, to migrate them. Uh, there are some resources which I'm giving over here. But apart from that, if you have any questions, um, you can always uh, um, reach out to me um, on my email or this is my Twitter handle. 
Yes, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Harsh. Still no questions, so please, any any demo or sure. finishing for, for the finish, but I think... Yeah, definitely, yeah. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, yeah, what I would do is um, um, now, uh, you know, I would spend some more time on the final suggestions and best practices. So, as already um, covered on the on the resources uh, uh, section, right? Uh, so, this the, the, the one key aspect which I would uh, definitely uh, stress stress upon is the roadmap aspect because a lot of customers which I've seen is uh, they do not completely, you know, um, completely do a due diligence on a product. Uh, before actually making big big commitments right uh, be wary of uh, generation one products maybe wait for the project uh, products to be matured maybe you know maybe a couple of years down the line and then you know or you can adopt them immediately but do a do a complete due diligence before you actually you know, you know can adopt uh, uh, or you know uh, use those uh, within your edw uh, landscape right yep. uh, one question shikarsh uh, sure. But I think I, I think I can answer that. Is there a uh, question is from Christopher O'Callaghan. Is there a link available for a copy of the slides? And he says fantastic plan. I think uh, it, they will you you will send the, the organizer will send these yeah. to attendees later on, right? Sure. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So one other thing I would stress upon the last point, Azure Databricks. That's an excellent product with respect to, um, yeah, you know, that was this product is by inventors of Spark. So it can actually help you do both the activities, both the data engineering as well as data science. This is gaining a lot of traction of late. So you know, definitely you know, uh, uh, focus on this for your ELT, ETL, and also your data science. Uh, workload and it also has very good integration with all the ecosystem of Azure, be it your Azure Data Lake Store or you know um, and other components as well. Yeah. Okay, maybe we can wrap things up, but uh, this is another question. Phase three is most interesting. Could you please talk more more about that? But uh, we're near we're nearing Which, the end of our presentation. So about what? About what? Phase, phase three, in your plan. Oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, phase three. Um, so maybe uh, in, in a word or two, sure, five words. Yeah, definitely. Right. So essentially, in phase three, um, uh, what we are doing is we are considering. In, if you look at our initial case study, uh, we wanted, um, you know, uh, the customer wanted a data science sandbox environment. So what you would do is you would set up a data uh, bricks and Azure ML based environment, and maybe what you can do is you can execute a POC or a uh, use case for them, maybe sales forecasting or supply chain forecasting, and tell them how to use it. Because Azure ML is an excellent tool with respect, it's an UI based tool. It has inbuilt algorithm, so you can use that to you know create a sandbox and you know train the users to use it for other scenarios as well. Hello. Yes, Shikarsh. Uh, sure. Maybe maybe we can we can wrap this up. Sure. Uh, I think the attendees and me as an attendee, we we shall get the your presentation with the plan. And we'll send all our questions to you through your email or Twitter handle. Definitely. Uh, okay. So thanks, uh, thank, thanks to all attendees. Thank you all for attending. I also think that this was a excellent presentation. This was a 24 hours of past presentation. Goodbye and hope to see you all, hear you all pretty soon. Thank you all. I enjoyed presenting it. Thank you. Thank you, Milan.